Theory is History by Jiris Banaji. Uh, chapter 7. Late, Antiqu Late Antiquity to the Early Middle Ages. What Kind of Transition? A Discussion of Chris Wickham's Magnum Opus. 7.1. Introduction. Marxist Uncertainties. A Marxist characterization of late antiquity in the early Middle Ages, the whole period from 300 to 800, grosso modo, involves at least two sets of issues. First, what would a coherent Marxist characterization of the economic structure of late antiquity look like? In sharp contrast to Stalin's theory of the final extinction of classical slavery in a slave revolution, slavery was widespread and entrenched in the post-Roman West. It is certainly not disintegrated under the hammer blows of a revolution, much less one carried through by slaves. But does the persistence or revival of slavery mean that a slave mode of production dominated the class relationships of this period? Something like this was argued by Pierre Bonassi from his seminal work on Catalonia. Bonassi suggested that Catalan society in the 9th and 10th centuries was still a slave society. Serfdom emerged from the violent and dramatic rupture, the crisis of public authority, that characterized the 11th century. And in this classic late feudal sense, it was not a feature of the early Middle Ages. On the contrary, the persistence of a slave economy constitutes one of the chief features of Visigothic Spain. However, no Marxist historians have gone as far as this. And if anything, they have done the opposite, projecting either serfdom or feudalism back into late antiquity. Thus, A. Barbaro and M. Vigil refer to the feudalization of Spain under the Visigoths, arguing this at length. And among British Marxists, Geoffrey de Saint Croix could even suggest that serfdom was the predominant mode of production in the later Roman Empire. This bears some resemblance to Rodney Hilton's view that late antiquity had seen large land landowners creating the production relations characteristic of feudal society. From at least as early as the crisis of the third century, town life had been contracting and self-sufficient serf worked states had begun to dominate the social structure of the empire. Hilton was clearly referring to the institution known to Roman historians as the colonnade, but at a deeper level. His views reflected a, a tradition of late Roman historiography shaped less by anything Marx himself had written than by Max Weber's famous lecture of 1896. The paradigm which Weber himself did more to define than most was one of widespread economic recession and a ruralization of the life of the empire. The identification of the colonnade with serfdom, common to most historians of the early 20th century, St. Croix was its last great representative was clearly what underpinned the half-baked conception of late antiquity as a precursor of feudalism. Today, almost no serious scholar accepts this view, if only because feudalism itself is still so contested. So where does this leave us in terms of a general characterization of the late antique world? A more solid Marxist characterization can surely only come from the conjunction of new perspectives within the historiography itself and simultaneous attempts to map out the conceptual landscape in new ways. For example, John Halden, Manuel Astien, Eduardo Manzano. The second set of issues relates to our notions of feudalism and of the transition from late antiquity to the early Middle Ages. How well does the theory of modes of production work for this transition? Do Marxists have a coherent understanding of the feudal mode of production? If a fully articulated feudal economy only emerged in the central or even later, later Middle Ages, what do we make of the early Middle Ages? What do we mean by serfdom? And when did it, and when did it evolve? There is scarcely an integrated Marxist position on these issues. For example, St. Croix implied that there was no integral link between serfdom and feudalism, and seemed to think that serfdom could form a mode of production sui generis since it was, as he said, the predominant mode of production in late antiquity.
In contrast, Hilton, with more sense of historical specificity, had always seen serfdom as central to feudalism. But Hilton also believed that serfdom should not be defined by labor services alone, whereas Marx himself had done precisely that, claiming in one passage that serf labor has this in common with wage labor, in respect of rent, that the latter is paid in labor, not in products, still less in money. Not only was serfdom for Marx the broad basis of social production in the Middle Ages, but its pure form involved the exaction of labor services, a position that is clearly at odds with Hilton's view that labor rent was not an essential element in the feudal relations of production. In even greater contrast to Marx in Wickham's recent book, The Lord's Lack of Control of the Labor Process is almost built into his definition of feudalism which emerges here in the more abstract structuralist guise of any system of course of rent taking that pits landlords on one side against peasants on the other. It was this kind of abstractionism depleted of historical content that Anderson had blasted in some of the best pages of lineages, even if his own conception of the feudal mode was a haphazard conglomeration of features that failed to have any significant impact on the historiography. The best work by medievalists working in a left-wing tradition has been decidedly discontinuous, underlining the novelty of the Middle Ages. The paradox of Wickham's conceptual choices is that, however one sees that novelty, it is not definable at the level of the mode of production, since his notion of the feudal mode is construed so loosely that it covers both the Roman Empire and, probably, the whole medieval world and much else besides. The tendency to dehistoricize categories such as serfdom and feudalism in order to be able to extend their application to antiquity is surely a retrograde one. It stems as much from the lack of a more sophisticated Marxist theory of the feudal motive as it does from any conception of late antiquity as a precursor of feudalism. But Chris Wickham's book is certainly the best starting point for a discussion of these issues. 7.2 background to the late empire. In Russian history, the late empire refers in general to the period between the 4th and the 7th centuries, the 4th and early 5th if the focus is Western, since the Western empire fell apart in the 5th and 6th and early 7th as well, if we look at the East. The 4th century is thus the watershed that divides Roman from late Roman history. Yet, the basic elements of the 4th century empire were established in the 3rd, with the sweeping reorganization of the army and the emergence of a new command structure on one side, and on the other, the sustained expansion throughout the late 2nd and 3rd centuries of a network of provincial, mainly African, families who would later form the core of the Western aristocracy under Constantine in 306 to 337. Reform of the army excluded senators from military command and signified a major break in the traditional pattern of upper-class dominance. If this was a democratization of the Roman army, as Lopuz Zansky suggested in a seminal paper, it certainly paved the way for the evolution of a professionalized officer corps and the consolidation of an esprit de corps in the higher ranks that dominated much of the political history of the late empire. By the 4th century, senators were marginal to the composition of the army leadership, which came increasingly to incorporate a strong Germanic component. The key result of all this was that, from the main part of the 3rd century, emperors were drawn overwhelmingly from non-senatorial military backgrounds. The politically relevant elite was not the senatorial class, but a military elite, whose upward mobility found renewed resonance in the civilian side of the administration as bureaucracies were expanded and professionalized, and a new value set on legal and related forms of expertise. The social fluidity of the late empire was the key to its sudden effervescence. The Senate itself was transformed and expanded early in the fourth century, and the equestrian order subsumed wholesale into the senatorial class, infusing administrative and business skills. The consolidation of the Western aristocracy meant crucially an adjustment with the state, the ability to maneuver and as far as possible dominate. 
By contrast, in the East, state and, arist state and aristocracy were much more closely integrated, since the aristocracy was itself of bureaucratic origin and the bedrock of the state's apparatus. These differences would become a major part of the story of why the empire survived so spe spectacularly in the East when it fell to pieces in the West. The key innovation of the late empire that broke with centuries of tradition was Constantine's monetary reform. Just as the military revolution of the third century was decisive in defining the style of the late empire, vesting state power in the hands of the military, Constantine's creation of a new gold currency provided the pivotal foundation that sustained the expansion of the governing class as a whole, both senators, new and old, and bureaucracy. As one, contemporary com com as one contemporary commented, the aristocratic elites of the fourth century accumulated vast quantities of gold so that the houses of the powerful were crammed full of it. In the West, the countryside scaled new peaks of activity as the owners of these vast hordes of money capital expanded productive capacities and upgraded their fixed capital investments, a process which is best documented archeologically for the Spanish countryside, most spectacularly in the very rich 4th century villas of the northern Meseta. To ensure efficiency, the state intervened to pin labor down to the large estates, contriving new definitions that were antithetical to the purism of classical law. In short, the 4th century dramatically reconfigured law, society, and economy in ways that were a disaster for the lower classes. For the Italian historian Santo Mazzarino, all this was a major part of the crisis of the Western Empire. In the sense that the peasant masses felt themselves crushed under the weight of the new economy and sought protection with the aristocracy against the state, the small peasant proprietors turned themselves into dedetissi de de of the rich, or as it was called in Celtic, vasi. These Mazzarino claimed, are the first hints of the economic system of vassalage, which marks the Middle Ages. To offset the crisis, government unleashed a prolonged deflation, which in conditions of insufficient productivity brought the society nearer to a natural economy. Thus, that is, with vassalage on one side and natural economy on the other, both rooted in the conditions of the late empire, they set off toward the Middle Ages. This framing of the transition of the resilience of, of an empire undermined by social crisis is conspicuously absent in Wickham's book. Indeed, it will be striking to his colleagues in Italy that there is no reference to their great mentor, Mazzarino, not even in the bibliography. Wickham, Wickham charts a very different course, abandoning the speculative looking constructions of the 1950s and its textual tools in favor of a wider range of sources and considerable emphasis on the archaeological work, late Roman and medieval, of the last two decades. For Mazzarino's uncomplicated trajectory from late antique Petrosinium to medieval vassalage, a model of almost appealing simplicity, Wickham substitutes more involved and densely textured history of landscapes, exchange networks, aristoc aristocracies, and urbanism, and of the fragile autonomy of the peasantry all moving in complex and uneven ways in a fragmenting world whose sinews were being remorselessly severed throughout the, this period. The collapse of the state and the fragmentation that flowed from it are the structuring principles of Wickham's discussion of these diverse trajectories. Unlike Perrine, who saw the disintegration of the Western Empire as a political fact with minimal implications for the continuity of Romania, Postponing the great catastrophe that ended it to the Islamic expansion of the later 7th century, Wickham ascribes momentous significance to the crisis of the state. In particular, the breakdown of taxation, by which he means taxation in kind, had major long-term impacts in the West, a crisis of the urban traditions of antiquity, with major changes in the scale and quality of urbanism, a general weakening and impoverishment of the aristocracy, and the slow but inexorable disintegration of the Mediterranean world system.
All of this happened unevenly, of course, and Wickham tracks the changes with a strong sense of their local peculiarities. Mapping the real or hypothetical evolution by region and subregion, and constructing a transition model of considerable complexity. I have dealt el elsewhere with what I regard as the major analytical weakness of the, of the model, namely its failure to integrate money into an overall account of the transformation. So here I shall deal with a different set of issues. It is a tribute to the profoundly stimulating character of Wickham's book that it throws up a whole lot of issues which are still largely unresolved. Chief among the Chief among these, as I see them, are the following. 7.3 Unresolved Issues 1. How do we characterize the dynamic of the late empire? Wickham has clearly moved away from the model of the other transition, where state and aristocracy were seen as distinct and rival claimants to the surplus. And the system as a whole was driven by the state so that the breakup of the Western Empire was a victory for the aristocracy. In framing the aristocracy as a major casualty of the dissolution of the empire, an aristocracy and state no longer embody rival modes of production. Yet the new picture is no less problematic. At least the model of the other transition drew attention to an internal conflict. The aristocracy sabotaged the state, abandoned or deserted it, and left the Western Empire to its fate. Numerous historians have argued this, from Sunwall to Peter Brown. In framing, the model lacks any internal dynamic. The decline of taxation, triggered by the invasions and the breakup of the empire, unfolds like a huge tidal wave that drags the senatorial elites along, shattering the structures of their dominance. Inter-regional networks, urban prosperity, the economic unity of the Mediterranean, and so on. Second, why use the imagery of modes of production to characterize the transition from the late empire to the Middle Ages? If, as Wickham claims, the feudal mode of production was the normal economic system of the ancient and medieval periods. The timelessness of this image contrasts sharply with the momentous changes that transform the ancient world into a medieval one. Two, how widespread was slavery in late antiquity? A concentration of slave labor in mass producing workshops based on an intensive rationalization of labor processes had sustained massive exports of Italian fine wares down to the Augustan age. This was a type of Roman industrial slavery with striking resemblance to more recent forms of work organization. Repetitive work cycles, job simplif simplification, and tight control over labor. With the rapid expansion of rural estates, villas, following the bloody civil wars of the early 1st century BC, an agrarian version of this slave mode of production came to underwrite Italy's domination of related Mediterranean markets for wine and olive oil. It would make more sense to call these economic regimes slave capitalism, following Max Weber and Otto Hintz, than anything as vague as a slave mode of production, since it is far from obvious that there is a commonly agreed definition of the latter. In any case, this regime had more or less ended by the second century, whereas slavery continued and was even widespread in late antiquity. Wickham discounts its significance, however, because for him the numerous slaves of the late empire or the period following it were not for the most part anything other than tenants. This, I shall argue, vastly simplifies the actual transition from Roman to medieval relations of production, slavery to serfdom in the conventional meta-narrative, which it would be more accurate to describe as involving a mutation of slavery than its outright supersession. Three, a third issue relates to our characterization of the rural labor force in the post-Roman West. Wickham wants to see the early Middle Ages as a low point in the general curve of, er of aristocratic dominance. Whether that translates into reduced domination of the peasantry in the earliest Middle Ages, as he wants to argue, is less certain. Surely this will depend on how we characterize the labor force at the base of the rural economy in the post-Roman world, and whether we see the slaves and freed people provided with plots of land as workers as Ross Faith has argued, convincingly in my view, or peasants as Wickham would want, 
One of Wickham's most insistent leitmotifs is the triumph of the realities of tenure over legal, disting legal distinctions. The point can be accepted, but it certainly does not rule out other models of greater complexity, as faith is constructed for the inland labor organization of Anglo-Saxon England. Four, finally, and for Marxists, most fundamentally, is the schema of modes of production, helpful in characterizing the major transformations of the period Wickham deals with. If so, how would we have to formulate the transition, given that serfdom did not replace slavery in any obvious way? And does Wickham's own handling of historical materialist concepts such as mode of production help or hinder a materialist analysis of this? In what follows, I shall suggest that the legacies of the Roman world and of late antiquity were more subtle than any straightforward debate about continuity makes them out to be. And that key among these were, one, the pervasive influence of Roman law in defining the condition of the medieval peasantry, and two, the tradition of direct management, which the Mero Merovingian aristocracy in particular inherited from their late Roman counterparts. On the other hand, the aristocracy itself and the organization of estates show major changes that mark a break with antiquity. The relations of production of the early Middle Ages were thus shaped by a complex set of influences that owe, us, owe as much to subliminal, sublim, subliminal legacies, law management traditions, as to the will of the Frankish sovereign and his magnates in developing a new kind of rural enterprise. 7.4 the reshaping of relations of production. What the post-Roman world inherited from the massive legal edifice of the late Roman state was a legacy of oppression. In other words, central to any characterization of the form of Roman society that emerged in the fourth century must be the increasingly repressive legislation of the late empire, which eroded the rights of farm workers in particular. In the words of Moses Finley, there was a gradual erosion in the capacity of the lower classes to resist working for the benefit of others under conditions of less than full freedom of contract. It is this that explains the paradox of why, despite the disintegration of the Western Empire and the dissolution of, of its aristocracy, there was no visible change in the economic, economic position of most or, or many rural inhabitants. Indeed, the post-Roman labor force was in one respect at least worse off, in the sense that the sharp division between slave and free that was intrinsic to classical law was progressively abandoned, in practice anyway, as a uniformly servile tenantry evolved by the early part of the 6th century. This, I suggest, is why we need to take the colonnade more seriously than Wickham does. It is next to impossible to account for the transition from the relatively open labor markets of the 3rd century to the mixed servile labor forces of the 6th and 7th centuries and later, without the decisive historical mediation of the colonnade. The key assumption behind the system was that resident workers were part of the capital assets of the estate on which they lived and worked, hence part of the estate's tax liability. A rapid turnover of labor would undermine the stability of the system and to ensure such stability, both government and landowners concurred in tying workers to estates. The lawyers who drafted the legislation of the late empire rationalized this peculiar subordination of free labor with the legal fiction that tied laborers were slaves of the land to which they were born. In other words, attached to estates and not landowners. But of course, in practice, the colonnades simply reinforced the power of employers over labor. That it did so explains why, in the Roman-controlled parts of the Mediterranean, this agrarian system survived down to the end of the 6th century, if not later, certainly long after its fiscal origins and function had been forgotten. 7.4.1 The Legacy of the Colony <clears throat> Wickham's handling of the colony is the least satisfying part of his superb book. The successor states inherited a labor force that included large numbers of former colonists, many of whom were or were still regarded as unfree workers 
tenants. Did these groups fare differently in the different kingdoms, or did they share an essentially similar fate? And if they did, what fate was that? In other words, what difference did the dissolution of Roman power make to the condition of these workers or peasants? There are scarcely any references to the colony in a post-Roman context, and it seems likely that the system had it disintegrated in its classic late Roman form. But what became of the colony themselves? Some historians argue that the distinction between these groups of the labor force simply disappeared. As the late Roman colony were absorbed en masse into a more or less undifferentiated post-Roman servile class, and from now on treated no differently from slaves. For example, Finley asked, were the survey of the Germanic codes all chattel slaves? The Visigothic laws, for example, ignore colonae, yet we know that they certainly existed and were important in the Visigothic kingdom. This is not a position Wickham would want to identify with, in part because he thinks that legal, hence also servile status, mattered less and less as one moved into the Middle Ages, and partly because he sees the independent peasantry expanding as the Western Empire disintegrated. It is possible that there is room for both positions, depending on how things played out in the post-Roman West, but it would certainly have helped to have started with a clear conception of what the colonatus itself was, something Wickham does not do both because he is, I think, unduly skeptical about the value of legal sources and because of his at least tacked support for Jean-Michel Carrier, who's, or Carrier's own iconoclas iconoclasm on this subject. To take just two examples from the legal evidence, one late 4th century constitution confers on a state owners the authority to control their workers with the care of patrons and the power of masters. The power of masters was, of course, the power masters ex exercised over slaves. Another earlier one stipulates that workers who run away from estates should be dragged back in chains. On any straightforward reading of this sort of evidence, most historians would conclude, and many still do, that government massively reinforced the power of large landowners over rural workers and did so in sweeping ways. But the point is one Wickham is, for a Marxist, curiously, unwilling to concede. The reasoning seems to be something like this. The colonai were not serfs, but tenants. If coercion was applied to them, this was largely from the standpoint of the state and its need to ensure the regular payment of taxes, hence stable labor forces. How far government succeeded in tying down these workforces must have varied enormously in practice. The laws may not have been effective. In any case, the colonate had more to do with the technicalities of taxation than the realities of exploitation and control of labor. By way of a response, let us begin with the first proposition about colonai not being serfs. In some influential work from the 80s, Kade mounted a strong attack on the back projection of feudal characteristics to the late Roman period, not just serfdom but labor services and manners as well. None of these were handed down to the Middle Ages from late Rome, especially not serfdom. A medieval reading of late Roman institutions is profoundly misleading. This part of Cade's critique is of course unproblematic and few historians would disagree with it today. It stems in fact from the positions of Mark Bloch, except that Bloch saw things in the reverse perspective. He had denounced the assimilation of the serf to the colonists as a contrived anachronism, tracing its roots to the late 13th, early 14th century when it emerged under the influence of the kind of legal erudition that had led the way in the reception of Roman law in Europe. But the colonnade itself raised no issues for Bloch. It was, as the law codes said it was, an institution that tied the peasantry to the soil and even invented a special vocabulary to express that. Indeed, in the chapter Bloch wrote for the Cambridge Economic History of Europe, he took the colonatus sufficiently seriously to call it the fundamental institution of the late empire. Kede's argument moves in a very different direction. He suggests that the conventional view of the colonate as a coercive labor system lacks any foundation in the sources. <clears throat> 
In other words, that it stems solely from the false assimilation that Bloch was the first to expose. A careful reading of the Roman legal sources shows that considerations of fiscality were the only ones paramount in the late Roman discussion about colonae. There was no institution like the colonnade, if by that we mean that the legislation of the late empire created a special status between slavery and freedom and imposed this on a large, if indeterminate, part of the rural population. The Roman law of persons recognized only two categories, free and slave, and that division remained axiomatic even later. It was never breached by the creation of a third category like half free. True, the legislation of the 4th and 5th centuries refers repeatedly to servitude, comparing the tied tenantry to slaves, calling them slaves of the land, and prescribing slave-like treatment for those who fled their estates. But Cade suggests that these references were purely metaphorical, and that the laws themselves had no intrin intrinsic connection with labor or with labor regulation only with the registration of taxpayers on the tax rolls. If rural workers ended up being tied to estates, this was part of a wider fiscal subjection that affected all sorts of groups and tied all of them equally to their place of or places of origin or professions. The adscriptici, whom the Emperor Justinian could not help comparing to slaves, were never actually reduced to a state of semi-slavery, at least not in the 4th and 5th centuries, so Kere so Kere more recently, said Kere more recently, since no such condition could exist in Roman law. Now the view that the laws in the colony had largely fiscal aims is scarcely controversial. A. H. M. Jones argued for it convincingly way back in the, in the 1950s, suggesting that it was primarily a fiscal measure when it was first introduced. Jones made it plain that he was referring to the origin of the measure that first led to the tying of labor to the land and not characterizing the institution as it worked, collusively, no doubt, over some two or three centuries. Thus, he repeatedly emphasized the considerable stake that substantial landowners had in the working of the colonnade. If the tying of the agricultural population was in origin a measure dictated by public policy, it proved a great boon to landowners or landlords. It was at the demand of landlords that the system was maintained and extended. And, of course, the system itself had drastic implications for the position of a large part of the labor force. Between this view, which has no problem with a fiscal origin for the colony, but attaches equal importance to its actual historical function, e.g. Bloch's description of it as class legislation, and Keddie's lecture iconoclast, Wickham, as I said, inclines to the latter. Thus, he refers to the laws on colonai as a set of laws about free taxpayers, undeterred by the nebulousness of this conception. And he prefers to think that even as a set of legal arrangements, the laws about it may have had little practical significance, that is, in the way things worked on the ground. Law is a dimension of reality, not a picture of it, and there is no reason to suppose either that people were fully aware of what the laws actually were, Augustine, Augustine's hesitations about the way landowners treated their laborers is a good example, or even that they were even widely enforced. Wickham does not deny that the laws prescribed the, the tying of labor to the land. Indeed, both he and Kere seem to think that the whole rural population was tied in this way, including the free peasants, something for which there is in fact much less evidence, as Jones realized. But given that the tying of labor is not denied, at least as legal intent, there are two debates here. First, did the laws make any material difference to the position, status, civil rights, etc., of the free working population? Did they entail a worsening of status for those sections? A uh, status for... Why are German words so long? A status virtschlechterung, as the German legal historians call it. And second, were the late Roman colonized simply tenants in Wickham's sense, that is, rent-paying peasants in control of their own labor process.
At times, Wickham seems to identify the colonnade with tenancy per se. For example, he refers to the sea of the colonnade, meaning simply the prevalence of rent-paying tenancies. It is abundantly clear that the laws treat tied laborers, workers described by Pope Gregory as ex conditioni legati, bound by their legal position, as not fully in control of their own lives. Not only were they attached to estates by law, but when they fled and worked elsewhere as sharecroppers or wage laborers, they were regarded as behaving quasi sui arbitri ac liberi, as if, as if they can make their own decisions and are free. The least this implies is that as coloni, workers bound to estates, they were not so regarded. Again, it was commonplace to describe such workers as being owned by their employers or in their possession. Although not formally incorporated into the law of persons, there is no doubt that the legal traditions of late antiquity did eventually acknowledge diminished degrees of freedom, broadly approximating an intermediate status like half-free. References like a kind of servitude were not metaphors, but attempts to reconcile a new social reality with the unyielding framework of classical law. This is strikingly obvious in the legislation on mixed marriages. These were marriages between persons of different class backgrounds and the late Roman laws about them, about which unions were valid and which were not and what and which were not and what consequences that had for the legal status or conditio of spouses and children were destined to have a profound influence on the conditions of the peasantry in medieval Europe indeed down to the final abolition of serfdom in the 18th and 19th centuries. For the general rule, the transmission of status through the mother, um, when the marriage is between persons of unequal status, the children shall follow the mother. In other words, state owners had automatic right, rights of control over the progeny of female laborers, even if their husbands were free persons. But what if male workers married women who were free? According to the general rule, the children born of these unions were technically free, and landowners stood to lose a younger labor force if they could not have the law amended to stop such individuals from pursuing their freedom, that is, migrating from estates that would otherwise hold, hold them down as tied laborers. Hence, repeated complaints in the 6th century that Justinian's legislation was depleting estates of their workers, and the conundrum Justinian himself found in trying to reconcile established legal principles with the labor needs of the aristocracy. Interestingly, the key references here are to landowners in Africa and the Balkans. All of this has been discussed in detail in a very substantial paper by Wolf Eckhart, um, Vob, which Wickham inexplicably ignores. The general point to make here is that the post-Roman West was strongly influenced by these late Roman legal traditions and that they came to form a decisive link between late antiquity and the Middle Ages, where the colonized simply tenants. That the supply of labor was seen as their chief social function is clear from the legal evidence about landowners who take in fugitive colony having to compensate previous owners for the loss in labor power or services. <clears throat> in fact, the only explicit definition of terminology that we have, we have comes from the 6th century, when Justinian tells us in so many words that the term colonist refers to those who live on estates and work as rural laborers. To sum up, even if imperial laws were concerned with tax paying, not labor relations, as Wickham claims, there is certainly enough evidence both in the legal sources and elsewhere to suggest that late antique large estates depended on a tied labor force. Certainly, serfdom was not a replication, much less a survival of the colonnade, but it does not follow that the colonatus was not itself a form of bondage. What distinguished late Roman forms of bondage from their medieval counterparts was that they, crucially, were buttressed and mediated by the state. We can, in this sense, speak of the construction of the colonnade as opposed to its organic or spontaneous evolution. Marxists can surely generate more specificity than Geoffrey de Saint-Croix managed to do by defining the colonnade as a form of exploitation of labor. <clears throat>
built on the legal fiction that the worker was attached to the estate and not the landowner. This was obviously a fiction since no one can literally be the slave of an object, even though this restricted the flexibility of owners in the sense that they could not transfer labor between enterprises or sell land without the workforce. In practice, everyone understood that tying workers to the soil meant attaching them to their employers. Um, I guess EG, CJ, X, XI, 51.1 states straightforwardly that rural workers in the provinces of Palestine be bound to their landlords. When even that restriction, uh, workers tied to estates, not landowners, was abolished, as it was under Theod Theoderic, the ground was cleared for a model of bondage closer to servage. Uh, 7.4.2 Slavery in the Post-Roman Labor Force Wickham Works, indeed, has always worked with a stark opposition between the slave mode and tenant labor, ignoring the intermediate agrarian organizations that are more likely to have characterized the general, epochal transition from slavery to serfdom. What makes the slave mode special is the systematic subjection of slaves to the control of their masters in the process of production and reproduction, put them on a family plot as a service quasi-colonist, and they organize their own farming practices and family structures. The combination between a greater autonomy for what can now be called peasants and the end of effective intervention by landlords in the procedures of production transform the whole logic of the economic system, or as Marx called it, the mode of production. He adds, when the Romans abandoned the slave mode, they went straight over to rent paying tenants. But Bloch was surely more correct in viewing the slaves holding as a form of salary and slave tenancies as labor tenancies. In his famous essay, How and Why Ancient Slavery Came to an End, he suggested that estates needed reserves of labor power and that the land granted to slaves was like their salary. The most incisive formulation of the distinction implicit here comes in Ross Faith's account of the labor organization of the inland in England, Anglo-Saxon England. She argues that freed slaves were more like workers and serfs more like peasants. Because of its importance, the passage is worth quoting in full. It was probably common to provide slaves and feed people and freed people with small plots of land when they were housed. This process, for which French provides the useful term allotment, has often been seen as the main agent which transformed the slavery of the ancient world into the serfdom of the medieval. However, it is important to make some distinctions here. The housing of slaves brought into being a class of smallholders who were completely dependent on and tied to the inland. But the category of peasants who came to be called serfs in post-conquest England mostly came into being by quite a different route. The essential distinction is between worker and peasant. The freed slave was a worker who in return for selling his labor as a commodity received a wage in land from the Lord who was his employer and sole purchaser of that labor. The Lord, in his capacity as employer, was essential to him. By contrast, the serf was a peasant with a holding, which, however small, supported him and his family and provided a surplus, which was transferred to the Lord in rent paid in cash, kind or labor, or in all these. This transfer of the serfs surplus was only made possible because the Lord had control of, control, control of the land. The Lord was not economically essential to his existence as he was to that of the slave. In short, slavery did not simply fade away, but had a longer life than was previously supposed. Nor was serfdom, at least the serfdom of the 10th century, its natural successor. There was a more complex set of relationships between slavery and serfdom than a simple transition, if by this we mean that one was simply substituted for the other. 
Even less credible is the model of a dramatic and compacted transition between them, such as that posited by Benassi and Bois for parts of Europe around the year 1000. Wickham, of course, does not subscribe to either subscribe either to a linear transition, the famous meta-narrative of vulgar Marxism, or to a compacted one. His favorite image is the conversion of slaves into self-managing peasants, which is really equivalent to the thesis that Roman landowners abandoned direct management. Thus, in framing, he endorses the very substantial position that most survive um, mancipia in our period were tenants who controlled their own holding and could keep its fruits after rents were paid. This is highly unlikely. Mancipia included former colonae, bound tenants in Servi, were still slaves in Francia, Visigothic Spain, etc. And it is doubtful if these groups in particular were ever thought to control their own holdings, whatever other groups may actually have done so. A substantial part of the rural labor force of the 6th to 8th or even 9th centuries comprised groups who, like faiths inland workers or worker tenants, were more proletarian than peasant-like and often unmarried. In the Middle Rhine region, studied by Franz Stab, Staub, <laughs> these groups were still called Mancipia in the 8th century. This in contrast to the Servi, who, like Wickham's self-managing tenants or faiths serfs, were a better model of the peasantry, that is, autonomous, even if subaltern. Staub suggests that this special sense of service already goes back to the Mer Merovingian period, but terminology evolved in different ways in different parts of Europe. The Domesday service was a slave, so too in Catalonia, where the lawyers never used the word service except to deny that attached peasants were servi, a word used only for slaves. Finally, in Italy, the word used to describe slaves who had no habitation in which to lead a, a separate family life, but who were lodged in outhouses in the courtyard, was prebendari from preber, to provide, which underscores their dependence on the doles provided by the employer. Thus, Wickham's reiterated thesis of the general dominance of tenant production throughout the period that he covers is too much of an abstraction to give us any sense of the subtle ways in which relations of production changed. Slavery was widespread in late antiquity and continued to be so in the kingdoms that followed the empire. What we have to try and reconstruct are the estate structures that use the labor of both slaves and colonai in a legal and economic context where the differences between these groups became increasingly irrelevant. Wickham does not confront the issue of late antique, early medieval slavery in any serious way, beyond the formal acknowledgement that it survived as a legal condition. The implied conclusion is that the survival of slavery in this more abstract sense had no implications for the way landowners used labor or organized production. It is hard to believe that when the Spanish church fought to retain control over manu manumitted slaves, Mancipia, who had been freed by a previous bishop, for example, it was seeking to retain control of tenants who, on manumission, were likely to migrate elsewhere. Why would tenants in control of their own holdings and work process wish to leave in the first place. A closer reading of the conciliar legislation shows that what these mancipia or servi owed the church before and after manumission were obsequi, that is, services, in other words, their labor power. Toledo 4, Can 73, 633, is especially revealing because it shows that lay landowners used the same mechanisms to retain control over the labor of freed people. The council ruled that slaves were who freed by masters who chose not to retain control of their services were free to become clerics, but those, sorry, there's a lot of errors in this text. <laughs> it's kind of making me nuts. The council ruled that s slaves who were freed by masters who 
who chose not to retain control of their services, were free to become clerics, but those who were still bound to employment even after manumission, because employers chose to retain control of their services, could not be admitted. Throughout the 6th century, in fact, the term mancipium was progressively extended to include former colonae. One upshot of this was that the word lost its strictly classical meaning, chattel slave, in fact, the most reified expression for a slave, to function as a generic description for a labor force characterized by looser forms of bondage. That the mancipia are consistently associated with domus, houses or dwellings, in the 7th century Mero Merovingian charters suggests that this increasingly undifferentiated labor force were provided with allotments, which, as Faith remarks, were of a size well calculated to prevent them becoming self-sufficient. In the will of Aridius, late 6th century, these allotments are called peculiaria from peculium, the assets managed by a slave, and what is interesting is that these small plots of land cannot be sold or gifted away by their occupants. Thus, the labor force of the early Middle Ages is probably best characterized in the expression faith uses for the late Anglo-Saxon inland, a mixed servile labor force. Wickham exaggerates the degree of control that peasants had either in the Roman countryside or in the early Middle Ages. To equate the colonnade with tenancy when we know that, for Wickham, an agrarian system based on tenancy is also one whose basic productive processes are under peasant, not landlord, control, is to leave the reader with a strangely anodine picture of the late Roman world. Who would dream of proposing a similar argument for the Anglo-Saxon Geber or the Castilian Calizos, both close medieval counterparts of the late Roman colonai, even if not actually descended from them? Again, to describe the Visigothic Servi as unfree tenants, elides the strictly Roman classical law meaning that service retained in the barbarian law codes with the more purely medieval sense which the word acquired only later in the 8th century. Post-classical slavery was not a purely legal determination. Liege Visigothorum 4 2.9 refers to estates being cultivated by servarum multitudines, masses of servi. An odd expression of all these servi were a scatter of autonomous tenancies. It is much more likely that the servi were simple farm laborers on a home farm, as P.D. King suggested. Visigothic equivalents of faith's farm servants huddled on the inland. Under the Ostrogoths, the Italian colonai originari were reclassified as mancipia and their masters were now free to transfer them between estates, again suggesting that if these were simple peasant families, they certainly had little control over their working lives. Of course, it does not follow that the typical post-Roman large estate was organized in terms of gang slavery, as Anderson supposed, or supposes. What it does imply is that the post-Roman elites in Francia and Spain inherited a tradition of direct management of the land which they saw no compelling reason to abandon. This, arguably, was Rome's most substantial economic legacy, next to the vibrant monetary economy that the Umayyads inherited in the eastern provinces. 7.4.3 The Legacy of Direct Management The direct management of the early Middle Ages was certainly a Roman legacy. The contrary view, that Roman landowners gave up direct management when they abandoned the slave mode of Wickham himself, and for example, Pasquale, stems chiefly from Domenico Vera, but it is crucial to note that Vera's reconstructions lack any documentary base even vaguely comparable to papyrological archives, Merovingian charters, or Carol Carolingian or Carolingian inventories. Reconstructing estate management from a collection of letters, even those of an aristocrat, <clears throat> is a bit like <clears throat> is a bit like trying to grasp the structure of the labor process in a large manufacturing firm from the correspondence of its shareholders.
Having said this, it is of course equally clear that the stereotype of slave-run latifundia being turned into surf-worked estates is no longer credible. As the preceding pages suggest, and much of Wickham's own argument shows, the transition was obviously much less straightforward. The continuity in traditions of direct management did not imply a continuity of estate structures. The manor was a Frankish innovation, as were labor services. Yet the serfdom of the central Middle Ages was shaped by and evolved out of the long continuities that were bound up with late Roman traditions of labor management, the drive to create a tied labor force, the increasing stigmatization of those workers, the peculiarly repressive laws regulating valid marriages, and the transmission of, of a status, the more or less rapid emergence of a servile labor force where workers who were technically free under Roman law were simply reclassified as servi mancipia, something close to slaves in the barbarian law codes. All of this flowed with other later developments, the expansion of peasant tenures, which began in the seventh century, the evolution of labor services in the eighth, as well as the huge political changes of the 10th and 11th centuries into creating the historically specific kind of servitude known as serfdom. Equally important here was the retrieval of Roman law in the 12th century and the role it played in constructing, encouraging the definition of serfdom, both ideologically and legally, one product of which was the late Roman colonists as an abstract prototype of the medieval serf. This autonomous history of law is a superb example of what Marx described with a sense of wonder as the problem, the really difficult point of how relations of production develop unevenly as legal relations. None of this suggests that serfdom descended from the colonnade, and acknowledging these manifold and converging trajectories is not equivalent to writing a linear history. Given this framework of the subtle interplay of subliminal, subliminal legacies, long continuities, historical innovation, and political rupture, it should be possible to go back to strands of a less complex continuous history, such as that written by Perrine for the Merovingian Epoch, and weave those strands into a history that is more densely textured a la Wickham. Perrine saw the survival of the largest state as a decisive link between the post-Roman world and the Middle Ages proper. Thanks to the domain, the economic basis of the feudal system already existed. Here, Perrine identifies the element of continuity with the survival of Roman traditions of estate management, suggesting that they formed the basis of the system that emerged later. Now in the period covered by Wickham's study, 400 to 800, most aristocratic estates were organized on three basic models, ville, masse, and manners. The East had its own forms and is not considered here. Of these, the manor was a specifically medieval creation so that Roman traditions of direct management were chiefly embodied in the types called ville and masse. Masse were substantial blocks of land, consolidated estates that were usually leased to conductors who are best described as entrepreneurs engaged in short-term financial speculation who assumed the management of the estate for the period of the lease and whose ranks might include members of the aristocracy. They were more dominant in Southern Italy in the islands than anywhere else. A late fifth century massa that we know about contained the standard mixed servile labor force that I've argued was typical of the post-Roman West. In this case, in Quilini, here, simply another name for colonai and servi. The villi or the ville were the crucial transmission belts of agrarian continuity. The substantial Merovingian estates of the 7th century were called ville because they were built on essentially Roman traditions of land holding and management. Bishop, Bishop Bertram of Le Mans owned over 74 villi. See 57 or circa 57? No, C57 of these in undivided ownership. From the general description of their features, it is clear that these were physically compact or integrated estates, not dispersed properties interspersed with the estates of others. For example, the, ex the expression cum termino suo 
occurs repeatedly, referring to the outer boundaries of the villa. As consolidated spaces, villae were susceptible to division, fragmentation, but also reconsolidation. Adrian Verholst describes this typically Merovingian form as an estate directly cultivated by slaves who had no holding and lived on or near the center of the estate. We may call it a demesne centered estate. My only quarrel with this would be to, to prefer slave and ex-slave farm servants. Since manumission was widespread by the several or by the seventh century, and employers often retained control of their freed people. The main point, however, is that the typical Merovingian estate exploited a landless workforce. In England, the counterpart of this estate structure, the inland, was only finally superseded in the 12th century in a late and brutal development of the manorial system. By contrast, the villa form was distinctly archaic by the 9th century in large parts of the continent and probably disappeared earliest in the core regions of Frankish control between the Loire and the Rhine, where the manor came to embody a new form of labor organization, better resourced, bigger and more efficient. That the Merovingian estates of the late 6th and 7th centuries were not structural innovations, but rooted in the cultural and economic con continuities of the successor states would, in turn, have to be argued by constructing a model of the late Roman villa estate. Like the, like the Merovingian estate, the late Roman villa was sufficiently physically coherent or compact to have a name. And if it was substantial enough to appear on maps or similar documents, both textual and archeological evidence for the grouping of workers and settlements within the estate shows that these enterprises were based on a, res on a resident labor force. These settlements were called Visi or Cassus. For example, the Anissi, destined to be one of the richest families of the fourth century aristocracy, owned several estates in the olive growing regions along the Libyan coast already by the third century. One of these called Cassus Villa Anicurum. This was a region characterized by massive flows of migrant labor, much of which may have been tribal. Large African estates retained squads of seasonal workers for the harvest. Estates that handled their own harvests were obviously directly managed. And it is clear from the archeology span of the Spanish villas, villas here in an architectural and archeological sense, both that much of the labor force was housed within the estate. And that in Spain, at least, there was a substantial continuity in the organization of estates between the late Roman and Visigothic periods. A major part of Wickham's argument relates to the crisis of the villas, meaning their progressive disappearance throughout the former provinces of the Western Empire. Villas, in this archaeological sense of the actual structures identified on the ground, disappear soonest in the northern parts of the empire, and last of all in the core Mediterranean regions that remained under Roman control. In Italy, the 5th, 6th century is the period of the definitive dissolution of the villa system part of a much larger and complex transformation of the landscape that happened between the third or fourth and seventh centuries. Wickham downplays the catastrophist potential of this image of the withering away of the villas, proposing a cultural explanation for their demise. In another discussion of his book, I have suggested that all it reflected was the crisis of the Western aristocracy, the progressive loss of control of the countryside and its overall disintegration as a unified imperial class. Villas survived best where the old Roman aristocracy also survived, for example, Sicily, and simply disappeared elsewhere. But clearly the emergence of new elites also had a cultural context and the two explanations are easily complementary. This raises a final issue, one which is central to Wickham's analysis and the most solid part of his book. The considerable evidence for a crisis of the aristocracy is a major part of the transition to the early Middle Ages. This too should really come under the reshaping of relations of production, so that is where I shall discuss it briefly this time. 7.4.4 What happened to the aristocracy?
In Wickham's reconstruction of the evidence, one major trend that runs across the whole period from the 5th to the 7th centuries is the erosion of the aristocracy. The late Roman aristocracy survived longer in some places than in others, but the late 6th, early 7th century was a watershed in most places, as the remnants of the senatorial class were finally absorbed, exterminated, or dispersed, and a new kind of aristocracy stabilized, as in Francia, or began its gradual, in England very gradual, emergence after 600. The best case of this hiatus is Italy itself, for, as Wickham noted elsewhere, even, even if it is possible to track senatorial families down to the time of Gregory the Great, this is no longer so in the 7th century, not even in Rome. In other words, the Italian aristocracy suffered large-scale disruption in the 6th century. This is one model of what happened to the late Roman aristocracy, but there are at least three or four others which shows how uneven the transition was and why Wickham's approach, grounded in an acute sense of local peculiarities, is fundamental. This is a case where some degree of schematism may actually be helpful. Model 1. Large-scale disruption is best attested by the fate of Italy's aristocracy, partially exterminated and otherwise destroyed by war and fragmentation at various times throughout the 6th century. The Gothic War was a disaster for the landed aristocracy. Model 2. Aristocratic mutation, the emergence of a new kind of aristocracy, more medieval than late antique. Francia is by far the most or the best example, because it is so well documented, not so much in Gregory of Tours' 6th century narrative, as in Book 4 of the Chronicle of Fredegar where the focus is the early part of the 7th century and the intrigues of powerful factions of the new Frankish ruling class. These precocious medieval nobilities of the sub-kingdoms or Telreich were in place by 600, the products largely of royal benefactions and of the considerable circulation of estates within the ruling establishment, the church included. Especially striking here is the sheer mobility of landed property related to the rapid reversal of political fortunes in a landscape where rival kings fought to expand control and consolidate support, but the result also of an intense competition for land and a resilient land market. The Lombards and Visigoths have their own weaker counterparts of these processes, except that we know much less about them. Tom Brown's work shows that the same model can almost certainly be extended to the Byzantine-controlled parts of peninsular Italy. Here the church remained the only element of continuity, as an administration dominated by military officials spawned new landed groups drawn from the military class, a new kind of elite, in other words, whatever we choose to call it. Model 3. Survival. Sicily and Sardinia are the pure examples of this pattern, microcosms of elite Roman world frozen in time, the remnants of a Western aristocracy basking in the protective gaze of the Eastern Empire. Um, here, probably well into the 7th century, all the basic institutions of late Roman civil civilian life, the colonnade, money taxes, the substantial circulation of a gold currency, and villas in the architectural late Roman sense continued with no discernible break, a model that would, in modified form, apply to North Africa as well, I think. Finally, Model 4, Flight, a dispersion of the aristocracy which is best exemplified by the fate of the families who had dominated the East Mediterranean down to the Sassanian and Arab invasions of the 7th century, roughly from 610 to 642. For example, emigration was a widespread response of the Greek-speaking upper classes of the coastal towns of Syria, or again on the eve of the Arab invasion of Alexandria, Several thousand of the wealthiest families are reported to have fled by sea. When Carthage was besieged by Hassan B. L. Newman al Ghassani in 695 or 695, the last late Roman aristocracy of the Mediterranean again fled, some to Sicily, others to Spain. Thus, Model 4 is best reflected in the Byzantine controlled parts of the Mediterranean that fell to the Arabs, that is, the east and the south.
These are the broad patterns then, at least outside the core regions of the empire that did survive, though it is still hard to say what happened in England in the fifth century. Wickham's impression of a dramatic pullout seems likely, the one one reading of the Welsh evidence that seems to have been much less true of Southeast Wales, where Roman legacies, massive estates and charter writing may have suffered less dilution. On balance, I would be less continuist than Wickham is for the East Mediterranean. He downplays the flight of the aristocracy as well as the massive disruption it suffered in the Arab invasions. And less fixated on aristocratic impoverishment, after all the Umayyad elite was fabulously wealthy. North African landowners could pay substantial sums to buy off the Arabs in 647, decades after the economic involution of Tunisia is supposed to have begun, and the top echelon of the late Roman aristocracy had in any case comprised a tiny fraction even of the governing class. 7.5. Final Comments. Wickham and Modes of Production. A key issue is how we characterize the dynamic of the late empire. For Wickham, the fiscal motor is central to this characterization. Moreover, this was a fiscality where taxation and money was less important than taxes in kind. The coherence of the wider economy thus depended crucially on the transport of bulk goods for fiscal needs and the, infrastru the infrastructures this threw up. On its own, on its own, this fails to explain how it was possible for the Mediterranean to see such a substantial growth in the money supply in late antiquity. Since Wickham has no obvious explanation for this, he tends to ignore it as well as the whole tradition of historiography that made the monetization of taxes central to the com conflicts of the 4th century. The accumulation of vast sums of gold in private hands suggests a more complex set of relationships between the aristocracy and the, and the state, one where the neat division between them is less obvious. Tension, clearly the state was not reducible to the aristocracy and their interests, were often in collision, but also control and collusion. The colony is an excellent case of the last. Peter Brown's perspective query about the extent to which the bureaucracy's regulations on the colony colluded with the needs of the great landowners. My own analysis highlights other features of aristocratic dominance, huge monetary expansion and a tax system less dominated by payments in kind than Marx believed or Wickham supposes. A widespread use of free labor compel or coupled with more rigorous forms of subordination that gave the aristocracy well nigh absolute control over the lives of their employees and the fact that government was defeated on the crucial issue of patrocinium. Much of the analysis in The Other Transition, Wickham's first mapping of these issues, breaks down if we see state and aristocracy as integrated with each other and not distinct groups in competition. In other words, if we see the late Roman state as essentially an aristocratic form of state staffed and controlled by an imperial aristocracy and the site of recurrent struggles between different factions of the ruling class rather than a dominant monarchy, etc., the ideological representations it had of itself. Consider the role played by the state in encouraging the expansion of aristocratic properties and the emergence of new elites and consider the integration of functions like tax and rent through institutions such as the Domus Divina, the state as landholder, landholder and the Pagarchy, the aristocracy as tax collector, and the drive to tie labor to estates. None of this suggests the kind of gap in class terms that rival modes of production would presume, which may be why both tax and rent are now seen as subtypes of the same mode of production. Wickham's characterization of the feudal mode is unrepentantly structuralist. There is no perceptible change in the stand taken in the other transition. Hindus and Hurst show rightly in my view that feudal relations are, present, are represented simply by tenants paying rent to or doing labor service for a, mo a monopolistic landowner class. One disconcerting upshot of this is that much of Roman history is brought under the feudal mode. It was, as he says in framing, the normal economic system of the ancient and medieval periods.
the economic shift from the slave to the feudal mode occurs well before 400 in particular in the second and third centuries. Here, the feudal mode refers simply to the expansion of tenancy. In this perspective, it would make no sense to talk, a talk of a transition between modes of production, since the feudal mode is seen as expanding in a gradual piecemeal fashion. The trouble with Wickham's use of these categories is that they lack any sense of historical dynamism. There is nothing in the way they are constructed that accounts for historical change. For Wickham, mode of production can have any of three distinct senses. One as a form of exploitation, slaves, tenants, wage laborers. Two as a form of organization of labor, labor service, slave plantations. And three as an economic system. At page 284 of his book, cultivated by the slave mode simply means cultivated by slaves. So too with slave mode exploitation. At page 301. At page 273, modes of production equals labor relations and refer clearly to forms of organization of labor, different ways of organizing the demesne. For the feudal mode of production, Wickham prefers sense one. For the slave mode, sense two. This enables him to stretch the feudal mode as widely as possible. On page 535 on his paper, El Fain del Imperio Carolingio, Carolingio, and conversely, to restrict the slave mode of production to a specific time and place, for, exp for example, on page 276 of Framing. Slaves do not have to be organized according to the slave mode, but Wickham prefers to avoid calling them slaves if and when they are not. The form of exploitation seems to have the capacity to generate an entire economic system through the kind of economic logic embodied in it. For example, in his essay on the end of the Carolingian Empire, which is why Wickham can equate modes of production with relations of exploitation, as in the passage just cited where estas distintis relationes de exploitation representen distintos modos de production. Produ I don't know. It would be foolish to deny that Marx's handling of these categories was far from finished. He never left us with a developed or mature theory of modes of production, and a whole strand of his thinking on these issues can easily be mobilized to support the sort of equations that Wickham works with. But Marx also had a profoundly historical vision of what the different epochs or periods or modes of production were, which is, of course, best demonstrated in his analysis of capitalism. It is this second strand in his work that should form the point of departure for us. Clearly, by the capitalist mode of production, Marx meant more than the, than the domination or widespread use of wage labor. He meant the laws of motion that are summed up in the accumulation and competition of capitals. Since most of capital was left unfinished, we do not have a proper or complete description of the interaction of many capitals, the most dynamic part of the system, and we tend to reduce the model to his description of individual capital in volume one which is one of its most abstract moments. In other words, relations of production, in Marx's sense at least, are just not reducible to the relations of exploitation depicted in volume one. They would have to include competition, credit, share capital, moments that each had an ab abschnitt in the 1857 plan, as well as the world market and crises to which he planned to devote the final book all of which were concrete determinations that Marx must, presumably, have lumped together in, in the general heading, Shapes of the Total Process, that was the proposed subject matter of the book three, or of book three, in the 1865 and 66 plan. The point here is that, by capitalist relations of production, Marx clearly meant all of this, and not just the general form of exploitation, described with such lucidity in volume one.